erudites is a humble initiative by some exceptional and foresighted undergraduate students of law with the primary vision to provide a platform for socio-legal discourse and scholarship. Our trajectory as an open e-journal intends to disseminate constructive, independent ideas and thoughts on socio-legal issues and national and international developments in the field of law and society. Lex Erudites volunteers to act as a stimulus to exhort the young aspiring minds from distinct fields of study to ink their free-spirited, reasoned thoughts and opinions, thereby contributing to informed and participative citizenry. I welcome everyone to the webinar conducted by the Lex Erudites on the topic Significance of Public International Law, the evolution, inception and revolution created by it. And today we are delighted to have a repository in this field who has enormous laurels in the field of international law. Today we have Ms. Therese O'Donnell, who is a reader and a graduate of law school, University of Strike Light Glass Law, and holds a postgraduate qualification from the University of Cambridge and University of Dublin, in addition to being a qualified solicitor. Ms. Donnell is also an expert in public international law and human rights law and has particular interest in research in disaster law, international security, and international law issues arising from World War II. I invite Ms. Do Do uh, Therese Donnell to take the platform to take us through the even and uneven types of public international law. I welcome you, Therese. Thank you very much, Akil. That's very kind of you, uh, and that's a very flattering uh, introduction. Um, I must thank, first of all, the organisers for today's event. It was I was really flattered uh, to be invited to contribute to the very worthwhile work which Lex Erudites does, um, and in particular to speak about public international law, which is um, an area in which I research and have taught for a very long time. Um, today, the uh, title of today's presentation is called Paradigm Shifts in the Significance of Public International Law um, and the Inception, uh, Evolution and Revolution within International Law. And what I would say is that I see paradigm shifts in a, a number of levels and in a number of ways. I think there have been structural shifts in international law. I think there have been conceptual shifts in international law. And I think there's also been shifts in substantive terms, in terms of how international law is made, what it looks like, and which areas um, it affects. If I could maybe ask the moderator to um, now um, switch on my presentation. Thank you very much. So that is uh, my title page, of course. And if we could now move to the next slide, I'd be very grateful. Thank you very much. Um, PIL's classic definition is that it is concerned with the relationship between states as among themselves and nowadays in their relations with international institutions. And that is a, a decent working definition. I would suggest that from my perspective, it doesn't begin to describe what public international law is, but it's a very useful, um, short, uh, succinct, way of understanding what international law does, and that is public international law. Um, what we have to remember about public international law is it is a completely different system to uh, national law. It is a decentralised system. There is no governing authority from which to uh, rule. There is no sovereign. Um, and it fundamentally precedes from a consent basis. So it is a much more horizontal system of law compared to the vertical system of national law. Okay, if I could please move to slide three. The United Nations, um, the organization as we call it, is the principal organizing authority within public international law, within contemporary public international law. And you'll see I've got the logo of uh, the UN uh, included there. And it very much has, uh, as you can see, the globe depicted in flat form, but also the laurel wreath of peace uh, enveloping it. And to the right of that image is the opening um, page of the Charter of the United Nations. We, the peoples of the United Nations. And so there is a, 
while I talked about states as a key actor in international law, the charter opens with the phrase, we the peoples. And so there is a, a desire to kind of think of individuals as making up those states. Below that, you will see the image of the United Nations building in New York. And this is one of the most famous buildings in the world. And it is, of course, where the main um, organs of the United Nations are situated. Um, it is uh, an, not a perfect uh, organization, but it nevertheless does a vast amount of work across the globe. And it's increased its reach into uh, the lives of all of us in uh, many different ways. Some we recognize very clearly and some are more maybe obscure. If I could turn now to the next slide, please. So the principal actors, if you like, in the United Nations are uh, 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 iterated on this slide. The current United Nations Secretary General is Antonio Guterres, um, and he um, is, the, in a sense, the chief operating officer of the United Nations. He's the public face of the UN. And we've had a number of very famous secretaries general over the years, perhaps among the most famous was Kofi Annan, who um, steered the UN through a, quite a tricky time um, in the late 1990s and into the 2000s. Antonio Guterres has made a number of um, points regarding the priorities of the UN and the eradication of poverty has been something that he's been particularly interested in. The next uh, sort of significant body within the UN I'd mentioned is the General Assembly. It comprises all UN member states. There are currently 193 UN member states um, and they comprise the General Assembly. It is where every state has representation. The next body I would mention is this UN Security Council. Now, the UN Security Council is an extremely powerful body within the United Nations. It is the executive body of the UN, and it has the primary responsibility for international peace and security within the UN. It comprises 15 members. Five of those members are permanent. The five permanent members are, of course, the US, Russia, China, the UK, and France. And there's been some complaint about uh, why these should be the five permanent members. And I think it's fair to say they probably do uh, represent the politics of 1945 when the UN was established. There have been various complaints about non-representation from the global south, no uh, significant representation from Latin America, um, Questionable representation from um, Asia and indeed India has uh, long felt it should have much more significant membership of the Security Council. Um, and uh, Oceania, for example, has, has no permanent representation, nor does Africa. Um, so there is uh, some discomfort about that. Why is that significant? It is significant because the five permanent members each hold a veto power which means that if a measure is being sought in the Security Council, and these tend to be extremely important measures, any one of the permanent members can block that. And that has raised um, a lot of upset, in um, particularly regarding the use of force, um, blocking of the use of force, um, and so on. And I'll probably talk about exercises of the veto during this talk. The Trusteeship Council is less significant uh, for our purposes in the modern world. Its role had been confined to moving um, what were the colonial powers to independence. Um, and its work was obviously concluded um, some time ago. And I'm not going to mention too much the Economic and Social Council. Uh, well, it takes care of those matters. The Secretariat effectively runs the UN. But the last body is important, which is the International Court of Justice, which is the principal judicial organ of the United Nations and a body with which those who work in public international law are very interested and very committed to. OK, could I have the next slide, please? The key areas of public international law, there are a huge number, and I really uh, couldn't iterate them all, but I can mention a few. 
The issue of territory is a major issue in international law. There are a huge number of boundary disputes which go to the ICJ. There are issues regarding territory broadly framed in terms of law of the sea issues as well. Um, uh, use of air uh, is also a, a big issue. And indeed, the emergence of new states and territories, a crucial aspect to being a state. Um, these are all significantly debated within uh, public international law. The use of force is a major issue in international law. This is uh, situations where states may feel that they have no option other than to use force because they have been attacked by or are threatened by um, another state. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more in detail about the use of force later. I will also do that with the law of armed conflict, um, which, sorry, I'm not ready to go to the next slide. Can we go back? Sorry. Uh, the law of armed conflict, international criminal law, environmental law, human rights law. I will talk all about these areas uh, later in my talk. Terrorism is obviously a very current issue and is dealt with at both national, I appreciate that, and international level. What you will find generally with the national measures uh, countering terrorism, they often take their cue from the international law on this area. That is notwithstanding the fact that there is no internationally agreed definition on what a terrorist is. Um, and I'm sure we can all work out why that is. They always say that one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. But nevertheless, measures have been taken by the UN against the sort of support, the activities that support terrorism. So banking, finance, uh, supply of uh, the sort of logistics of supporting terrorism, all of that is dealt with um, by the UN. Disaster law, an area I am particularly interested in, has been very much a new and growth area of international law. And then the more commercial aspects of international law, trade, investment, economic law, they are huge generators of cases and arbitration work. Um, and as you can imagine, in the increasingly globalised world, we obviously have the body of the World Trade Organisation, but you also have increasing bilateral investment treaties being concluded by states and associated complications that come from that. OK, so I'm ready to go to the next slide now. Thank you very much. Apologies for the typo, which I only saw after I'd sent my presentation. Uh, the sources of international law. What are the sources of international law? Well, these are principally dealt with in the statute of the International Court of Justice, and it outlines a number of sources, and I'm going to look at a few of those sources. Okay, so the main sources I would mention to you are treaties, customary international law, and soft law. Soft law is not mentioned in the statute of the ICJ, but here's one of the uh, paradigm shifts that we see. It has become an incredibly important um, source of law in international law. And I'll talk a little bit in detail about it in a minute. First of all, I would start with treaties. Now, treaties are the kind of classic um, instrument of international law. The images I have for you there are the swearing of the oath for the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. The Treaty of Westphalia and the end of the Thirty Years' War in Europe is considered to be, if you like, the foundation of modern international law. International law did exist before that. We had uh, religiously driven wars that were justified and international law terms. We had a lot of trade law that was dealt with uh, before 1648. But 1648 sees uh, under the, the kind of stewardship of a Dutch scholar called Hugo Grotius saw the kind of create a world that would be familiar to us, which was the rise of states, the diminution of, of body of entities or phenomena such as the Holy Roman Empire, and the, so the rise of states and the rise of uh, the kind of formal positivist um, approach to international law. So here we see the treaty being concluded, a, a painterly depiction of the treaty being concluded and the swearing of the oath to honour it. 
Um, the other image is uh, a series of agreements being concluded between India and China very much more recently. Now, treaties are favoured in international law, obviously, because they are, they are expected to be clear, they are written, there is a lot of negotiation goes into them, and the expectation is that they will be foreseeable and predictable in their effects. They are classically uh, agreement, written agreements between states. Okay, Now, there are possibilities for agreements to be oral, as you can imagine, those tend to be the subject of a lot of litigation afterwards when they argue over who said what to whom. Um, and there can be agreements between states and organisations uh, or states and non-state entities. The obvious example would be peace agreements, where states may strike agreements with rebel groups, for example. Um, nevertheless, um, those can be written agreements, which might be considered to be treaties, but the classic treaty is that between states. I've told you that the appeal of treaties is that they are clear and predictable. However, someone unfairly or unkindly rather once described them as simply being disagreements that had been reduced to writing. Um, and what I would say to you is that the interpretation of treaties can often be a matter of debate, just as interpreting um, national legislation is a matter of considerable controversy. You can imagine that that is scaled up when it comes to an enormous, effectively multilateral contract, um, because while you may have bilateral treaties that are just between two states, by far the, um, a, a huge amount of treaty law is taken up with multilateral and therefore multi-party um, um, treaties. And as a result, the capacity for debate, uh, misinterpretation, different interpretations um, is, is limitless. There is also a particular complication raised by the role of reservations. I told you that international law is essentially a consent-based system. States must agree to um, uh, to, must agree to the terms of the treaty and then agree to abide by it in good faith. However, if there is a tension between seeking to get the maximum number of states to sign up to a treaty and preserving the integrity of the treaty, and that inevitably involves compromise, because you don't want a treaty that no one will sign up to, but you don't want a race to the bottom with effectively the weakest obligations included. The way that this compromise is effected is reservations. And this allows states to say, I will agree to the terms of this treaty, but not that particular provision. Or I will agree to the terms of this treaty up to the limit of a certain um, nationally decided limit. OK, so it's to try and preserve the idea of sovereignty of states while also acknowledging that there is an international system. And the role of reservations has generated a huge amount of trouble in international law, notwithstanding its worth. One of the current areas of um, controversy with reservations is in the context of human rights treaties. So what you'll have is states will say, I will agree to most of the rights in this treaty, but not that one. Or more commonly, I will agree to all of the rights in this treaty, so long as they fit with our cultural, social, religious traditions. OK, um, this means that it's not entirely predictable what that state is agreeing to. If the reservation is vaguely phrased, essentially the reservation is an opt out or limitation clause. And if that's vague, then nobody is quite clear what that state's obligations are. And that's a problem. OK, having said that, states may have good reasons for entering reservations, which is they have to pacify an internal um, constituency who may resist the treaty altogether. All right. So what you may see states doing is trying to effectively walk a fine line between their international obligations and 
dealing with local populations and maybe trying to build confidence with local populations. Okay. Um, it's been a particular issue with regard to the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Um, and uh, there have been quite a number of reservations entered to that treaty. Some um, seem to have no effect in the territory that the treaty is effectively respected in its entirety. Other reservations seem to have quite a significant impact to the point where the state might be said to not be observing its obligations at all. So this has been an interesting area. And if anyone wants to ask me about that in the questions, I'm quite happy to develop that point there. OK, if we could move on to the next slide. Thank you. The next big area uh, of the other next big source of public international law is what we call customary international law. Customary international law is, if you like, international law's version of precedent. Uh, whereas in national law, we would look to former cases to build up a picture of what interna uh, of what a, a legal area becomes. In customary international law, what we do is we look at the practice of states. Okay, but not just the practice of states. We look also at what they think their legal obligations are. Okay, and what we have here is the development, a much more organic form of international law compared to treaties. Treaties and custom comprise the two principal areas of international law sourcing. They are the primary sources of international law. So what you may find is that an, a particular area of international law may derive authority from both treaties and custom in the same way that we would in a common law system where we would have statute and precedent. So we're used to that idea, okay? And in the, in the, cons, in the world of custom, what you're doing is looking at the practice. It's effectively like a treasure hunt. If you're trying to work out if certain if certain obligations exist in international law, you have to look at the practice of all different states. And you then have to look at what those states say they think they're obliged to do. OK, so a state may say, well, I behaved in this way because it was convenient. OK, well, there's state practice, but not opinio juris. Opinio juris is where a state says we behaved in that way because we had to, because we had no option to, because we believe it to be an obligation. That opinion will tend to be expressed by, for example, the foreign minister. Oftentimes it will be expressed by states speaking at bodies like the UN General Assembly. OK, and I'll give you an example of the evolution of a customary norm in a minute. The Another special customary norm is the so-called Use Kogan norm. And the Use Kogan norm is a fundamental norm of international law. It is intransgressible and um, a cardinal principle it is not possible to breach it. A, a contemporary example might be the prohibition on genocide. Okay, There is never going to be any uh, wiggle room, if you like, with that. Um, prohibition on slavery, probably another one. Okay. However, in modern times, the issue of whether a new norm had developed or not, arose in the case of Kosovo. Those are the two images that I've shown you there. In 1999, um, Kosovo was still part of the former Yugoslavia, uh, mainly dominated by what we now know as Serbia. And there were allegations of wholesale discrimination and abuse of the Albanian Kosovar population by the Belgrade authorities um, in what we now call Serbia. Um, this, uh, so this was also Yugoslavia um, and uh, the former Republic, uh, the former uh, Yugoslavia. Um, and the, the world was having these images communicated to of what looked like borderline genocide. And it went on over the course of about a, a year, the extreme uh, sort of violence and people began fleeing from the territory and they were fleeing into neighbouring states who were very anxious about what was happening. The question was, what could the international community do about it? States that were upset about it, United States, UK, a lot of neighbouring states like Germany, Italy were very concerned. They had no 
in a sense, no right to intervene in um, the territory of, Yugos of uh, Serbia and Yugoslavia because there was no self-defence argument. Those states weren't threatened by the alleged behaviour of the Belgrade regime. The question was, can you save strangers? The UN Charter is quite clear that you cannot use force against another state unless you have a right of self-defence or the Security Council authorises your action. Neither was the case here. There was no self-defence argument and Russia was blocking the use of any Security Council measure. So the question was, what can, what can we do? There was an argument that a new customary norm had developed, that of humanitarian intervention, that in extreme cases of human rights abuse, you could effectively have a third exception to the prohibition on the use of force. States cited a number of different examples. India's intervention in East Pakistan in 1971 was one of them. Vietnam's intervention in Cambodia in the late 70s. Uh, there were a number of practices. Uh, the US, UK and France uh, protection of Kurdish refugees in, um, in 1991 after the Gulf War, where they had created no-fly zones, was another example. Okay, Uganda, Tanzania in the 70s as well. Okay, So there was a, there was a kind of movement towards there was a lot of state practice. The UK in 1991 said it believed there was now an allowance, if not an obligation. And the question was, had that come to fruition? NATO intervened and bombed various sites of, of Serbia. Um, and the question was, was the action legal or illegal? The view is that it was probably illegal, but had very good intentions. And there was then a desire to regularise that behaviour of humanitarian intervention. And a new doctrine called responsibility to protect was established. It's not clear that that is in fact a new doctrine. It seems to repackage the original um, position, which is you still need Security Council approval. But there is an argument that we're moving in the direction of an entire, of, of possibly a third exception, arguably. OK, so next slide, please. Soft law, this is the last uh, kind of main source of international law I'll mention here. What we're talking about here is agreements, principles and declarations that are not legally binding. The, for example, a General Assembly resolution is not binding, but it is very important, it's very persuasive. And what you find with soft law is most of the measures are recommendations. They can be used to flesh out instruments, pioneer standards, as I say, and oftentimes what you may find is soft law eventually will lead to a hard treaty. I think it's better not to think of hard law, i.e. treaties, and soft law as strict and an either or. I think you're better to think of international law as like on a spectrum of being binding. All right. And some, some instruments are more binding than others. Whereas with treaties, the test is, are you observing it or are you breaching it? With soft law, what we're doing is we're trying to envisage compliance. Okay, sorry, if we could just go back a second, I'm not quite finished with soft law. And what I would say to you is I think that when it comes to international law, we have an ecosystem of infinite variety. We have a huge number of other sources of international law. We can look at the decisions of judicial bodies, such as Supreme Courts within territories. We have the International Law Commission. Obviously, the reform body in Geneva will draft new treaties. We have general principles of law that are accepted throughout nations. We have notions of equity. And interestingly, we have what's called Chapter 7 Resolutions of the Security Council. Those are the resolutions that will authorise the use of force. And I'll talk about them in a second. So if we go to the next slide now. OK, so the International Court of Justice is the main principal judicial organ of the United Nations, a particularly pretty picture of it there. It's based in The Hague. If we could just move on to the next slide. Thank you. <clears throat> 
what I would do, uh, what I would say to you is that jurisdiction is not compulsory. States, when they join the UN, are automatically eligible to uh, accept to buy in to the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice, but it is more a standing invitation that they can avail themselves of. Uh, they are not automatically subject to the jurisdiction of the court. The, the court has a mix of advisory jurisdiction and contentious case jurisdiction. Okay, so um, I picked out a number of landmark cases. I think this presentation should be available at the end of my uh, talk, should you wish to look at this later. Um, but I'll pick out uh, maybe a couple of cases um, that were particularly interesting. Uh, the Consular Relations in Tehran, this was in 1980. This is when the students, uh, the Revolutionary Guard, took over the US Embassy in Tehran and could not be said to have been done by the state. Uh, these were just students who did this, but eventually the state adopted their actions. And so it's quite interesting for state responsibility when a state decides to adopt actions of private actors as its own and then bears responsibility for them. The East Timor case is uh, important for the development of the law of self-determination. The um, legal consequences of the construction of the wall in the occupied Palestinian territory is the Israeli wall opinion, effectively. That's an advisory case where Israel was found to have uh, breached um, its obligations uh, by expanding the wall, its security fence into territories that it shouldn't have done so. The Bosnia-Serbia case is um, the prevention of genocide case. Here, the, it was an important case because the question mark was, could a state be responsible for genocide? In this case, it was held that Serbia was not responsible for genocide, but it was responsible for failing to prevent genocide, um, particularly in the case of the Srebrenica massacre, um, huge massacre in the mid-90s. And uh, obviously, latterly and most recently, we have a case uh, concerning the Chagas Islands. And I'm sure I don't need to tell you what that case is about uh, down in that territory. And it is obviously um, really about the, the death throes of colonialism and Britain. Um, well, it was not a positive case uh, for Britain's, uh, from Britain's perspective. OK, um, so... Uh, if we just move on now, I'm not going to dwell on key cases. There, the next, uh, some pending cases that I sort of mentioned to you that are particularly interesting. Um, the case of uh, Myanmar and the uh, treatment of the Rohingya people is Gambia has brought a case under the Genocide Convention against Myanmar. It will be interesting to see how that case plays out. There's been a number of interesting developments on um, on Gambia's standing, and it has effectively won those points. Um, but um, the effect of the coup on uh, the Myanmarese position uh, will be interesting. The relocation of the US Embassy to Jerusalem, Palestine brought a case against the US. Interesting, because of course it was the Trump administration which um, moved the US Embassy. I don't know if Biden's administration may act differently. Uh, also a bit of an issue about Palestine bringing a case as the court only accepts cases uh, involving states. It is not possible as a private individual or an organisation to bring a case. So Palestine standing before the court has been a little bit controversial. Um, again, we'll see how that plays out. And Ukraine and Russia, Ukraine has been complaining extensively about Russian interference in its territory. Um, and as you'll see, that's under some terrorism law. It's actually um, brought its case. OK, next. Next. Thank you. States, who gets to the states are principal actors of international law. I think it's fair to say. How do you become a state? Well, there is criteria for becoming a state in international law. You have to have territory, a population, a government, and capacity to enter into relations with other states. But that's just a matter of fact. Do we care about the quality of a state? Could any, any entity that was, could a racist or apartheid state satisfy that criteria, but really not be 
a very acceptable member of the international community. Well, that's where you might see that whether or not you become a state is arguably a matter of law, but whether or not you can exercise your statehood is perhaps a matter of politics. And therefore, you might be a state, but nobody will recognize you. And that means that nobody will do business with you, right? You won't be admitted to organizations, perhaps, if you refuse to accept human rights. And so what we see here is a lot of interface between law and politics. I'm firmly of the view that international law is not just politics. Um, politics has no kind of governing discipline and system, whereas law does. And the I see the division here. Of course, the two, the role of statehood and uh, recognition interplay with each other, but the, there is a distinct, uh, each occupies a distinct place in the question of whether or not an entity is a state for the purposes of international law. These have all obviously received, received challenges in recent times with self-determination. I mentioned external self-determination where states secede, uh, a republic, for example, secedes from a state. We see that in Catalonia at the moment. Scotland is another entity that might well be, we have devolution, but the question of whether we might be a state is doubtful. And so what I would say is Scotland enjoys internal self-determination because it has a huge amount of autonomy, but whether or not we take that next step to external self-determination, who knows? And the, the point of, uh, obviously, self-determination was principally about, originally about rather, the, the end of empire and allowing territories to govern and determine their own futures. The question was, did self-determination endure in a non-colonial context? This was debated in the Quebec case, which I've mentioned there. And the Quebec case says, basically, we're not breaking states up unless, unless you're subject to oppression. And if you're subject to oppression, then you might be able to make an argument for external rather than just internal self-determination. And so we see in Catalonia, as the violence increased, did the argument for external self-determination get stronger? Okay, next slide, please. Okay, we also have, I should mention, in terms of personalities and in international law, we have the rise of individuals, we have the rise of multinational corporations, and particularly we have the rise of non-governmental organizations like Amnesty International, they were and the Red Cross, which is an unusual one, they all have personality in international law. They can bring cases. Uh, they can intervene in various uh, matters. They can bear responsibilities. And we also have international organizations, which obviously are personalities in international law. What constitutes state responsibility? When is a state responsible for, for acts? There are ILC articles on this. And a state obviously bears responsibility for its um, the acts of uh, state organs. But it also may, in certain cases, bear responsibility for private actors. This has become significant the more states have outsourced their um, responsibilities. So you will see things like private military contractors, parastatal entities. Um, so what you have is this, you have state responsibility for state organs, then you have parastatal entities, which might be a, a, a formerly state-owned, state-run service, which has now been privatized. It will have some responsibility for that, perhaps. And then you have completely private actors that a state may use in certain situations, and that's the private military contractor or perhaps certain commercial entities. There you will see it. Um, you will also have issues in responsibility in international law of both state responsibility and individual responsibility. And I'll, you will see that perhaps in a war crime scenario where you may be putting a head of state on trial. So he represents the state, but he's also a, a, a person, a human being bearing responsibility. OK, the next slide, please. OK, I'm now moving on to uh, particular areas of international law, and I've got a few areas that I'll briefly talk about. So the use of force is the collective security system of the UN. And the three slide, the three images I've given you is the, uh, an image from the Korea intervention, uh, an image of 
uh, the kind of conclusion of hostilities in 1991 between the American general who was uh, engaged in the UN Act, who well, led the coalition um, against for the liberation of um, Kuwait um, and ejecting the invading Iraqi forces from Kuwait. And then the last image concerns sanctions. Uh, the UN is an organisation devoted to peace, and so it was a departure from a in 1945. That was a departure from a world which envisaged force as an inevitability. The UN collective security system has a it has a system of collective measures, including sanctions and the use of force, um, to keep the world in order. It also embraces notions of self defence and collective self defence where states may intervene on behalf of another state. So that was the situation in 1991, uh, 1990 to 91 with, um, with the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, as it, as it would be. The United Nations Security Council is the, the extremely important body here. And it is the body which has the ability to characterise situations as threats to the peace, breaches of the peace or acts of aggression. Article 51 of the UN Charter says that in the event of an armed attack, a state has the right of self-defence. And we can see this as raising challenges because the Charter views the world in terms of interstate violence, so one state attacking another. But is that so relevant in a world where attacks are less likely to come from states, perhaps come from terrorist groups on a state? Does that state then have the right to respond to a terrorist group under the Charter. And that's been the subject of considerable controversy. Again, I can talk more about that. Next slide, please. Okay, the law of armed conflict. Um, what we have here is a rejection of the notion of total war, okay, where anything goes. Here we have the regulation of war, that there are certain things that you cannot do, no matter what. Right. OK, so the law of armed conflict. So the first image there is the Geneva Conventions. Um, I was quite struck by the fact that the red seals, the wax seals on the on the pages there looked like blood. I thought it was quite striking there. Um, what we have are four Geneva Conventions of 1949. And obviously they were informed by the experience of the Second World War. And you will see there, I don't know if you can see the images too clearly, but there are certain cardinal principles that come out of those four Geneva Conventions. One, for example, you must, must make distinctions between combatants, those engaged in armed conflict, and civilians. It is never okay to target civilians, ever. Another key point is the protection of prisoners of war. Prisoners of war are entitled to certain standards of decent treatment. We also have protections for those within combat who have become injured or are no longer able to participate. They must be protected and taken care of as well. And we also have a complete prohibition on the infliction of unnecessary suffering. The 49 conventions were updated in 1977 with a number, uh, two additional protocols which sought to take account of developments in warfare, but also to take account of the new phenomenon of non-international armed conflict. And that's what we see since the sort of 70s onwards. We see much more uh, that international armed conflict is less typical. Uh, so the Russia-Ukraine situation is less typical than non-international armed conflict. Classic example at the moment is Syria. Okay, and the last image I've given you there is the tricky situation presented by child soldiers. And that's been an issue that international criminal law, international human rights law, international labour law has sought to kind of try and manage and diminish the use of children as soldiers. Those children are in Yemen, which, of course, I, I, again, I don't need to tell you what's going on there. Next slide, please. International criminal law. Um, war crimes trials, of course, uh, the International Criminal Court. The first image there is the International Military Tribunal for the Far East, uh, which, of course, was the parallel um, uh, proceedings to the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg. So the Far East one dealt with Tokyo um, and uh, that whole um, sort of conflict. And indeed, the Indian judge played an enormously important role at the IMTFE. Um, 
Um, the second image is the logo effectively of the International Criminal Court, the permanent standing body of the um, of criminal law. It is not a UN organ. It is in a relationship with the UN, but it is an independent court based in The Hague, um, principally responsible for trying a very limited number of crimes, uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide and aggression, not terrorism. Um, uh, not a number of crimes were excluded from it. Uh, for example, drug trafficking, that was all excluded. The third uh, image is Adolf Eichmann, who was tried, albeit um, he was tried under national law in Jerusalem, in Israel. Um, but that, of course, that national law wasn't hugely informed by international law regarding crimes against humanity and genocide. But it shows you that it is possible to be prosecuted at the international level and at the national level using international norms. The whole point about international criminal law is it formalises processes of retributive justice. The last image that I show you is the issue of rendition, irregular rendition. This was a real problem in the noughties uh, with the war on terror. That individual, it's, a, it's an artistic de depiction of someone in the orange jumpsuit with which Guantanamo Bay became unfortunately associated in counter-terrorism measures. And what you see here is um, a real problem that we want international criminal law to be formal and procedural because we need to protect the rights of, of accused and um, the noughties didn't really show that um, so that was that was quite a lot of breaches of international law occurred there okay next slide please coming to near the end okay so international human rights law I've listed a huge number of conventions here you can see that we have um, a mix of um, regional uh, provisions with the European uh, Convention, with the American Convention, the African Charter. Um, we have mixed enforcement. Um, I would say that the European Convention on Human Rights is its court at Strasbourg is probably the leading judicial enforcement of human rights law. Um, under the 1966 covenants we have there, we have UN committees which have a mix of a possibility of an individual complaint or application to those bodies and a, an issue, a mechanism of state review of reports, uh, review of state reports. I would just mention um, the second last uh, instrument that I mentioned there, the Yogi Yakarta principles on the application of international human rights law in relation to sexual orientation and gender identity. That's really effectively soft law, but it references other treaties, but gives them, if you like, an LGBTQ lens through which to see them. So I'm happy again to talk about that more if people are interested. Next slide, please. Environmental law. I can't really say a huge amount about this given uh, the slight time pressures. Environmental law is variously described as a great triumph of international law or a great failure of international law because there have been a huge number of treaties which have sought to very successfully limit air pollution, stop the transboundary uh, movement of hazardous waste, including radioactive waste. Um, a lot of that material was being dumped in Africa. There was a special treaty called the Bamako Convention, which managed to get control of that, to prohibit the import of waste into African Union members. The ozone layer regime was another big success of international environmental law um, in limiting that. But climate change has been the, the sort of lightning rod uh, for a lot of criticism. Although there have been attempts, and that's the, pa the image there is of the Paris uh, conference, if you like, that led to the Paris Agreement. There were complaints that states haven't really been observing their um, their limits uh, in terms of emissions, carbon emissions. Um, what I would say to you is that the Paris Agreement has decided to move away from telling states what their limits are to saying, well, you, you tell us what your limits are and you work towards them. And every time you change your limit, it has to go up. And it seems to be working as well as it can. Remember, international law cannot make states behave. It can just point out when they're not behaving, right? And states need to behave at some point. States need advantages. They need relationships. They can't just be a rogue. 
And so to a certain extent, the real politic plays in rather than against international law. For example, the Trump administration withdrew the United States from the Paris Agreement. And that was a that was a bit of a disaster. The US is responsible for about 30% of CO2 emissions. The Biden administration, within hours of President Biden taking um, office, re-entered, uh, started the stages for re-entering the Paris Agreement. So that's a really interesting um, point on the kind of realities of international law. Obviously, there are, and Biden seems to be quite keen on observing uh, international standards. And again, I can talk about that a little bit more. There's obviously uh, uh, the Outer Space Treaty. There's a lot of material on celestial kind of protections for the common heritage of mankind and, and betterment of knowledge. Again, I can talk about that. And the final slide, if we can just go to that. Sorry, I've slightly run on, but the final slide. Final slide is on disaster law. And what we have here is a set of draft articles. We don't know if they'll become a treaty yet. We're hoping that some good will come out of them. But what we have here is the International Law Commission has drafted articles and they may form the basis of a treaty. The matter was back to the General Assembly for its consideration to see what the way forward would be. It was a 10-year project at the ILC. The aim is to facilitate the cooperation, uh, international cooperation to help disaster stricken peoples. <clears throat> Excuse me, a disaster is defined as a calamitous event or series event of events resulting in widespread loss of life, great human suffering and distress, mass displacement or large scale material or environmental damage, thereby seriously disrupting the functioning of society. I don't think I need to tell you right now that the General Assembly said, let's just kick this on for another year and see whether or not these articles might have to be rethought in the light of COVID-19. I think the great widespread loss of life and great human suffering effectively is what we're all experiencing at the minute in states. Um, the question is, could these be, what might the application of these articles be in a COVID-19 setting? Well, there are real issues regarding the right to health access to affordable medicine, vaccines, protective equipment. And under these articles, there is a duty to cooperate. And the forms of cooperation, the forms of that cooperation might be making available relief personnel, equipment, goods, scientific, medical and technical resources. That seems to me to be directly relevant to distribution of vaccines, to um, uh, issues regarding the track and tracing, making that technology available um, to, but as in between states for nothing, for no cost, for no financial benefit. And so I think, again, if, if you're interested in this, I'm happy to talk about this. I'm going to conclude now. And I hope what you take from this is that international law is law. It's not confined to war, although that's a big focus for it. But it can be powerful and it can be a force for change. And even if um, it's uh, flawed and it doesn't work all the time, I'm not sure we would get rid of it. And I'm not sure what we would replace it with if we did. So thank you. And I'll look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Therese. That was a very in insightful session. It was just like a quick ride through the terrain of public international law. It was very informative and very insightful. So having held the position of visit, uh, visiting positions at the Lotterpad Research Center for International Law in Cambridge and Nottingham International Law and Security Center, I believe that you would be open to some questions from the participants. Of course. Of course. Because we, we have had some interesting questions from the participants who have been watching your session. Okay. So the first question, Ms. Therese, is that what were the compelling reasons which paved way towards the recognition and acceptance of public oh. international law? As you said in the start of the session, there were reasons for inception and formulation of international law so as to regulate the international interface and relations. So what was the compelling reasons for accepting the same? 
Right, that's really interesting. What makes states recognise and accept international law? There's a number of theories on this. Um, one of the big theories is that there is this notion that if you're within the, the international community, you are civilised. I don't like that phrase, but that's, that's, that's one of the theories. And that you are therefore a good sovereign. You therefore can retain power because you're a good sovereign. And this has been revisited in the Responsibility to Protect Doctrine, which reframes sovereignty as a right to being sovereignty as a responsibility. And so I think one of the ways you show that you're responsible is that you observe international law. And this is where we see the difference between legality and legitimacy. Um, because if an action is legal, it's more likely to be legitimate. Legitimacy is broader than legality, but legality is important to legitimacy. So I think that what you find is that states want to look good, right? And they want to look good because they want to deal with other states or they want membership to an international organization. A classic example would be China, a big, powerful state, signed the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It signed it because it wanted membership of the World Trade Organization. But that's the reality. That's, I don't think there's much doubt about that. China has never then gone on to ratify the ICCPR within its own system. So we can see that that commitment was really political, right? But it's an interesting insight in that it felt it couldn't not do it. It wasn't going to get into the WTO otherwise. So there is a kind of trade-off system. But there is also the situation, that's a very kind of cynical view of it, there's also um, a, a kind of gateway or conditional characterization of international law. But there is also that sometimes you believe in things. Sometimes you very much believe in it. And the UK in the late 1990s under Tony Blair was very keen to be seen as a state that was committed to international law because it believed in the project, it believed in international comity and peace. And so you do get a sort of ideological commitment to international law as well. And frankly, there's also third third justification I would give, uh, or third compelling reason is it's practical. It makes life easier. You don't need to constantly do visa negotiations or bilateral negotiations. And you tend to be more powerful when you're part of something bigger than when you're acting on your own. So kind of uh, political reasons, social reasons, commercial reasons, um, ideological reasons. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Therese. So the, the next question is, whether the public international law was intended to bridge over the social, cultural, and political difference yeah. of nations? Because in across the globe, there are democracies, autocracies, and other forms of governments. So whether the public international law intends to eradicate the cultural, social, and political difference among these nations and form a global nation. No. If, if that was the intent, how far is it effective? Yeah, I don't know if what, if that, what its intention was. I mean, I think its intention has changed across you know, hundreds of years, but I, I think in modern international, if we take the post-45 world order, I think that there's a real... There's a real confusion over whether or not you don't you want diversity, right? So you want diversity. You accept, you must accept that there are 193 member states of the UN. They've got very different political systems, even when they're the same. So democracy in one place doesn't look the same as democracy elsewhere. What you're concerned about, therefore, is eradicating that diversity. And I think particularly in a world where we talk a lot about decolonizing international law itself, we're very uncomfortable. I'm firmly of the critical perspective school, so I'm very uncomfortable about saying, well, everyone's moving towards democracy or everyone's moving towards one model, a sort of cultural model. But what you have is this debate is witnessed most particularly in uh, human rights law, right? This is where that, that real debate comes into play. And so 
what you're torn between is trying to, in a sense, I guess the one governing principle that, that, that cannot be wished away is equality, right? So how you do equality is maybe open to debate, but you can't ignore equality, right? So to say that what you've got to do is open dialogue. And so I don't think that I can give a simple answer to that question because what we see is a lot of, if you take my example of the reservations on the CEDAW convention, so we had a number of states, the like Bangladesh, Tunisia, Egypt, um, a lot of Muslim states uh, or states with a big Muslim constituency were considered to not be committed to that convention, that they had put in reservations. And a lot of Scandinavian states criticised these states all the time. And what they didn't realise was those states, the reserving states, were not all the same, right? They were really different from each other. And how their conception of Islam was completely different to each other, their conception of equality was completely different, and the experience of women in those states was completely different. Some women had a perfectly, um, a genuinely perfectly equal partnership insofar as we, you know, women across the world have completely limited partnership, but they had no worse than elsewhere, and some did not. And so we've got to be careful about essentializing what those differences are, I think. So I think public international law is better at getting more sophisticated at how it, it manages understandings of difference. But I don't think, I think maybe initially it went down the road of we've all got to work towards an ideal and I think it's stepped back from that. Although you see in Libya, Afghanistan, Iraq, all the transitions, all the transitional versions of government, um, that's been a bit of a mess, to be honest. And so regime change is, is a bit tricky. So, Ms. Teres, this is my doubt. So, is public international law is all about enforcing some basic human no. rights? part of the world i think there are certain certain rights that are that are non-negotiable right so i think there's certain rights that they're not going to be there's not going to be debate the, the prohibition on torture i heal is not is not open for debate no one should be torturing anyone the problem is what constitutes torture right so can certain religious practices constitute torture it's an obvious one, um, but I think that are there are it's seeking to enforce certain issues, international human rights law in particular, is certain to enforce certain minimum standards at the very least, and then to move up from that. Thank you, Mr. Ries. That's all, Mr. Right. Ries, The next question is a bit hypothetical, hypothetical question, but okay. yet interesting. Yeah, yeah. The question is, let's imagine a scenario where a codified system of international law is not present. What difference would it make to the global community in the 21st century? Okay, well, some might say we don't have a codified system, so I don't need to imagine it. It's already happened. Um, if we didn't have anything, what would the world be like? Well, it would be like 1647. I presume. I mean, it would be, on one hand, it would be a very rich, you know, 195 versions of regulation, which would be diverse and rich and interesting and authentic and, you know, community-based. And, uh, you know, it could be great. On the other hand, it could be chaos. Um, and... I think I think that there would always have been a desire. There's always people want to, to talk to someone outside. And the minute you get that, you need to establish ground rules. Right? So, I mean, you know, Marco Polo couldn't go anywhere unless he actually sought to engage on their terms with someone else. Um, and I'm not saying those were happy examples, but... There comes a point, I mean, trade is actually probably the driving force for a lot of medieval and post-medieval um, 
sort of early modern kind of international law where you I mean that's what's driving it is if you want if you want spices you've got to give them something how do you how do you strike that bargain that's just contract law right it's not anything more sophisticated and so you would you would have a world of bilateral arrangements and you'd have multiple bilateral contracts that, that's what I see it as being um and that would eventually, my firm view is that would eventually move into, let's just get one model contract that we all use. Well, yeah, that's called an international treaty, you know. it's, it's like, well, Yeah, that's a WTO, you know. So I think eventually people don't have time um, and they want to do things efficiently and best practices start to emerge. And so you, I think inevitably, if, if you got rid of international law tomorrow and said it's all about individual regulation, and as soon as states started to trade with each other, it would start to build up again. And so, you know, it might take another two or 300 years. I don't want to go through the 30 years war again. I think it would start to replicate itself, I think. But it, it, at the moment, I think it would be interesting. I'd be out of a job. That's not good. It would be a bit chaotic. Maybe it could work. I mean, maybe maybe it'd be really interesting, but I think it's less likely to happen now because of globalization. And I, I'm not a huge fan of globalization, but I think the kind of flatness, the end of geography arguably pushes against that hypo hypothesis likely to be likely to happen. Okay, Mr. Uh, Mr. Rida, the next question is, have the public international law foreseen a situation wherein the public international treaty is in conflict with the municipal law? Oh, yes, 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 yes. There's, there's lots of issues where international law clashes with national law. That happens, all, that happens really regularly. What you've got to know is that when you sign up to an international treaty, it's up to you to sort out your national law. Right. No one's interested. OK, because under the what's called the kind of super treaty, the treaty that called the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties of 1969, it sets down the rules for all treaties, in a sense, or all the main body of treaties. And it says, you know, pleading your national laws inconsistency is not a defense. Right. It doesn't matter. You sign this treaty, you sort out your problems. Now, of course, what can happen is you didn't realize or it only became clear later that there was going to be a clash between um, domestic and international law. Well, you have a number of choices. Change your domestic law, withdraw from the treaty, continue to breach the treaty in a limited way, um, seek to have the treaty re, you know, to have a case of some description and say, is what exactly does this provision mean? Can we harmonize these two interests? It happens, it happens, when I say it happens all the time, it's not unusual. Um, there sometimes, and this is the issue with reservations, reservations might say, we will observe this treaty insofar as it doesn't clash with our national law or our national social cultural practices. So you can see there that states are trying to, trying to create wiggle room. And that, that can be a bit, it can work, or it can be a bit problematic. Um, but it, it's not an unusual thing for states to find that there is a clash between their national law, particularly less with, less with treaties, although it can arise there, but more with custom. Because custom, there's, the custom is difficult because as custom develops with state practice and opinion juris, when does it become custom? And this is subject to argument all the time. Humanitarian intervention is a good art, is a good example. So what you have is a moment which is called the crystallization when custom becomes when when just state practice becomes custom. And then it binds the world. Okay, that's the big point about custom, is it doesn't just bind relevant states, it binds everyone, every state in the world. And so you may find that you never like that norm you never agreed with it and you're suddenly bound by it the thing to do there is when the norm is starting to develop you become what's called a persistent objector 
You get in early, you say our state doesn't like that, it's not going to abide by it, never liked it, didn't like it, doesn't like it, won't abide by it, still don't like it, still don't like it. And the more you repeat that, the more you stick to your guns, you will be considered exceptional and you will not be bound by that norm. It's very, very difficult to establish, but it's possible. The next question is with regard to the issue of statelessness. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. So is there a remedy under the public international law for the issue of statelessness? Yeah. Because that is rampant nowadays. And what is the scope of a global citizenship? Yeah. Is there a scope for that? Yeah, the UN is not keen on statelessness. The UN is very unhappy um, with the concept of people being made stateless. It's become a bit of an issue with, in the context of counterterrorism. So, for example, um, there's a, is there a remedy for statelessness? Yeah, it's difficult because the granting of nationality or kind of nationality jurisdiction or diplomatic protection, as it's also called, is something that is within state's discretion, right? There's not a lot left. Under Article 2 um, of the UN Charter, generally speaking, you a state retains certain powers, okay? There's not much of that left because of human rights law and all of that. A lot of your discretion is taken away. But nationality is one of those things that is left. And so uh, a state strictly speaking, isn't bound to have someone as a national that it feels has behaved in a way that is, for example, completely incompatible with that state. So in Britain, we had a big uh, situation with a girl, a young girl who went off to join ISIL. She became a bride kind of, of one of the ISIL fighters and had a catastrophic time in, in, in Syria, I think she was in. Uh, um, and... Uh, now wants to return. Britain has revoked that. Um, now, she is entitled to, if my memory serves me right, she's entitled to Bangladeshi um, nationality. She's never been there, or, or not in any meaningful way, and she, she doesn't want to go there. And so she is stuck in a refugee camp at the moment. Um, and there was a lot of complaint about that in Britain, um, a lot of complaint under human rights law. So... I th but of course, it, it's very hard for her to enforce her rights from abroad in, you know, in British courts, which have been unsympathetic to her. Um, and so I think that this is considered to be yeah, a real problem in international law, because it shows you how states are still very important because they're your gateway to certain rights. Um, and I, I mean, the... There, there, there are arguably remedies that you can you can spin statelessness into not being statelessness, but being, um, for example, disruption to your family life because they're there and you're here. Uh, so you might be able to rebrand statelessness in a particular way to get you a remedy, but it's as a as a kind of broad concept, it's much harder uh, to enforce. Um, however, I did think it's interesting if we. If we reconceptualize what personality is in international law, so at the moment we know it's states, we know it's NGOs, we know it's IGOs. What about diaspora? Okay. And if we start to understand that a diaspora can have personality, the cards would be it would be a kind of obvious one. There is no state, but there is a state of mind. If you like, there's an identity. Can we then think about stateless people in those terms? And I think they present a really important problem. Um, I mean, I noticed that one of the last Olympics, there was a, a stateless delegation of athletes. Um, and the UN is clearly, <clears throat> clearly pushing states to deal with this. Um, but as you can imagine, it's very hard to get standing, right? So if you've not got a state, it's very hard to actually, which state would you seek to enforce your, your, you know, your case in? And so, it, it, it's it's a terrible deprivation of rights, but then it's hard to find someone to help you unless another state, for example, extends uh, protections to you. But if you've been involved in terrorist activity, other states may not be that keen to do that, or they may that they may feel that 
I mean, there are, there's obviously the Refugee Convention, there's asylum provisions and all of that, but that's slightly different to statelessness, which is a particularly difficult, pernicious category. Because if you're a refugee, you've been a state, you've been somewhere, uh, whereas stateless, it kind of erases you. Sorry, that's a long answer without really giving you an answer. There's sort of as a remedy, but they're certainly not well served. They should be better served in international law, I think. And I think the case which you refer to, the case of a young girl, I think I read the article about it wherein the, the case went to the court in the UK, wherein the question was that whether she can defend her right to citizenship from the refugee camp outside. Yes, yes. And the, and the court negativated the position, yeah. saying that they cannot interfere in that matter. If subject yeah. to correction. Yeah, I no, remember. Yeah. She's, she's lost again at the Supreme Court yeah. very recently, within the last month or so, um, Shamima Begum. Um, yeah, she's, it's, it's been very active. I was really surprised at the last decision, but uh, whether or not that goes on to the European Court of Human Rights, again, what they've done is spin that as, a, as a, an access to justice issue, which is probably quite wise. So if it then goes on to Strasbourg uh, in the Council of Europe, um, it will be interesting to see how she gets on. But of course, this is years and years, and she's still there, um, and she's had a terrible time. And she made a bad choice, but she made that choice when she was about, I don't know, 15 or something. So to what extent that's choice is, is debatable. And in that case, the court equated the liberty of that girl with the entire security of the state. Yes, so yes. Yes, no, I mean, you know, it's strictly a, a state protective jurisdiction issue. That's how it's been presented. Absolutely. So one more question with regard to statelessness. All because right. in the second or third slide, Ms. Therese showed the UN Charter, which starts with we the people. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. So the people and the we there is we the nationals of so and so yeah. country. We the humans are not included in the UN Charter. Yes, is that I, true? I think that's a really good point, is that, yeah, I mean, there's... <laughs> Yes, I mean, insofar as there's a lot of theoretical debate on this accuracy, and if you want, you can go and read some of Hans Kelsen's work on it, but he says states are meaningless. The only constituency that matters is people, we the peoples. He's firmly of that view. Philip Allott, another great theorist in international law, he thinks the same. He thinks what we need is a people revolution that's all about people. Other people say, well, that's great, but you can't have... It's like, it's like Descartes' view of the French Revolution. He would not have agreed with the Assembly of Deputies, right? He wouldn't have wanted that. He didn't want elite representation. But these are things that are organizing principles. They are not ideological commitments. They are ways of actualizing ideological commitments through organization. So the state is an organizing force, but it shouldn't become more than the people's. It's only serving the interests of its peoples. Now, that presumes that your state cares about you. Um, and we can see in the operation of sanctions that when, and this is, a, this is a good way to show that and show there's been an evolution because when sanctions were imposed on Iraq for 13 years, the only people that suffered were ordinary Iraqis who had no influence over the government, right? Saddam Hussein, he was fine. He still had a huge palace with gold taps and all that. Ordinary Iraqis starved. Infant mortality quintupled, according to World Health Organization stats. So the view was that we were doing exactly what you said, which is we're, we're not serving the peoples. We're serving the elites, which was a disaster. And the, the elite that we don't like, you know, the sanctions were completely counterproductive. Now there is a view that you use smart sanctions, okay? So you target elites, you don't target, so you don't put a, a blanket sanction on trade. What you do is you say, um, look, we will stop this leader traveling. We will attack their bank accounts. We will uh, not allow them participate in things. We'll make life really difficult for the leader. So I think in that way we see an attempt to address we the peoples rather than we the states or we the elites. So we try and see the state as an organizing principle, but it shouldn't be any more than that. But it doesn't always work. But 
I think the, san- the evolution in sanctions policy kind of picks up on the point that you've made. Okay, Mr. S. Mr. S, would I be right to say that the evolution of public international law was preceded by friction and contingencies and complexities on international relations? And public international law was the right panacea to the same. Can we say that? Can you, can you just rephrase that, Akil? Because I, I just missed some of that there. Can you just say it again? Sorry, the connection wasn't great. No, would I be right to say that the evolution of public international law was uh-huh. preceded by friction and complexities in international relations? Uh-huh. And whether public international law was the appropriate panacea okay. to the same? Okay, I've got you. I've got you now. Right, I've got you now. Right, okay. Yeah, it's all the it's all the political scientists' fault. It's all the international relations people's fault. Yeah. Well, international relations, like they explain why there's a problem. They don't explain how to fix it. Um, and I think that there is a kind of there's a characterization of international law and international relations in in particular ways. And it is that, in a sense, international relations or polit- political science is a kind of aggressive discipline. It tells you what all your problems are. It tells you what you strategically can do to get an advantage or to mitigate a loss. It's like an accountant sitting there calculating things. So political science or IR is characterized as a way of calculating loss or advantage or really aggressive, you know, aggressively seeking things. International law sits at the same table but says, well, you can do that, but it will be illegal. And that will probably, you know, only you can work out if it being illegal is actually not in your interest. I'm not telling you whether or not it's in your interest. You work out. So the way to say is if you're a government legal advisor and the they want to invade a country, they've got no right to invade it, but it's got loads of oil or diamonds or something like that. And you say, well... You know, you you don't have a right of self-defense. You don't have a UN resolution. It's not legal if you invade. Well, they can go ahead and invade anyway. And you can say, but a smart political scientist will say, listen, if it's not legal, people are going to get upset. We will be, and as the lawyer, what you'd say is, you don't have a right to intervene. You will therefore be perpetrating a breach of the peace and they will have a right of self-defense against you. It's up to you what you decide to do. So I think that there is a kind of, um, I think you're right that, 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 you know, if we didn't have international law, let's go back to that other question. What you're doing is the theory in international relations, which is the billiard ball theory, which is that states are just banging off each other all the time. And yeah, that's the friction and complexity that you've just described. So how do you smooth that? The question is, you're not smoothing it to make some winners and some losers, because then you will always be a handmaiden of elites, right? You'll be a handmaiden of the biggest bully, rather than having a bit of a social project is, can we make it better for everyone, right? Can we diminish friction for everyone, rather than bring it to an end by someone winning? And I think that that's what international law Mm -hmm. seeks to do um, in the modern world, I would hope that's what it seeks to do. And I know the criticisms of it, but I think it seeks to try. It's a, maybe a slightly utilitarian model, which is to try and make things better for the largest number of people. The problem is, at the moment, it sits between these two. I mean, this is a famous kind of quote that it sits between apology and utopia. It sits between idealizing a wonderful world in the future that we'll never get to and a pol- or apologizing for power and I think it can be all of those things at once but I think the point is how can we lift up the most disadvantaged the most vulnerable the most ill-served in in the world and um and you know if shame is one of the things that works then you only feel shame if you know you've behaved badly right so you must have some notion of a standard there and that standard might be international law and that might be um, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Do you, uh, you know, if you look at a state which has lots of child soldiers, 
do those people love their children any less? I don't believe that. I believe those people love their children as much. But their regime, their state, allows conditions to operate in a way which vulnerabilizes the most vulnerable, even more vulnerable people, you know. So I did see a question. I see there was a question in the chat about outer space law. Yeah, that was it. What's the significance of international? Lots, lots is the answer. Um, I'll just answer this very quickly. Um, I was going to mention this in my presentation, but in, in outer space law, what you see is a move away from sovereignty, okay? Because no state can claim outer space, right? So the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 is all about that. And what we have now is that treaty is 111 states as parties, uh, 23 extra signatories. Um, so basically 100 and, what's that, 134 or so states are involved in the regime. And what it does is it prohibits nuclear weapons in space. It limits the use of the moon and all other celestial bodies to peaceful purposes only. Um, space is to be free uh, for exploration and use by all nations. So we see a diminution in sovereignty and a move towards the common heritage of mankind. OK, so that we, we sort of see sovereignty being pushed down a little bit here. Um, no nation may claim sovereignty, which is my point, of outer space or any celestial body. And although military activities aren't banned in space, for example, use satellites would be an obvious one, um, you cannot place weapons of mass destruction in space, you cannot establish military bases in space, and you can't test weapons in space. So the, the, there's a lot. There's also a moon treaty, which hasn't hasn't actually come to anything. Um, but I think what we'd say is there's a real desire to keep certain zones of the world as not open to sovereignty, not open to possession or ownership or exploitation or destruction. Arctic, Antarctic, outer space. These have to be preserved for future generations and for peaceful purposes only. I can't hear you, Akhil. Yes, uh, next question is with regard to the functioning of ICJ. All oh, right. Okay. So the decisions and judgments of ICJ, how can it be enforced? Yeah, if okay. the respective nations are not following it how can it be enforced okay well that's where you see the relationship between the international court of justice and the un security council because you will see that there's cross reference and provisions um and if you are a state that is not observing it and it's really significant you know i mean obviously there's always a bit of hassle with getting full compliance um but if it's significant, the UN Security Council can intervene and start saying you have an obligation to observe the decision of the ICJ. If you fail to do so, that may constitute a threat to the peace. That may then enable the UN Security Council to start saying we're going to take measures against you, right? So let's say it was a situation of, you know, kind of human rights abuse or a genocide type thing, a criminal kind of thing, then that might allow the Security Council to authorise force, to be honest. Alternatively, the Security Council may say, look, would you just do what you're told? And if you don't, we'll impose sanctions, right? So there's ways, but it's not, so, the ICJ doesn't really get involved in enforcement. That goes into the wider UN family, if you like. And I mean, there's there's been complaints about the Israeli security fence not being dismantled the way it should be, and but that's just kind of ongoing. It's ongoing on the agenda of the General Assembly. There's issues about uh, decolonization, the Western Sahara decision uh, opinion. You know, there's a slight difference between opinions which are abstractly given and contentious cases where there's clearly a state that's you know lost effectively. Uh, the last question. By okay. that, we'll be coming to the end of the session. Okay. That is what 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 materials or books would you recommend oh. for oh. a student who want to get the principles of international law? Because well. when I was in college, my teacher preferred the public international law by Stark. So is that? Oh yeah, Gosh, that takes me back. Yeah. Um, 
there's lots. I mean, the the Jan Clappers uh, has a very light book um, on international law. I can't remember what it's got. I've actually got a copy of it here, so let me just see what it's Yeah, it's just called International Law by Jan Clappers. Um, is based at Helsinki. I think it's a very good textbook because it's some of the textbooks are huge and dense and his isn't, but it's not a nutshell. It's a really good, pithy commentary on contemporary international law. Malcolm Shaw's book on international law is also very good. Brownlee, Principles of Public International, it's pretty dense, it's big and it's it's quite, for undergraduate students, I think it's a bit overwhelming. I think Clabbers is excellent for undergraduate students. And if you're just looking to read, it's a bit, it almost reads like a novel. It's it's very readable. Um, there's cases and material books, Dixon and McCorkadale and Williams. It's quite good. Um, and there's Oppenheim's International Law, but I think that's probably a more advanced piece. And there is whether there is any blog page or some other yes. platform. Yes, the European Society of International Law has an excellent blog called Egil Talk. Egil E J I L Egil Talk, and it's excellent. It's really excellent, um, and that will it's always doing like current affairs, and it's it's quite witty at times, and it's all really good people contributing to it. Thank so, you so much. A Thank you so much. And now we come to the end of the session. And I personally want to thank you for the way you uh, responded to our invitation and give, sparing your valuable time for us. And there is a time difference between India and the place we are, you are sitting. There's a huge difference. And amidst, amidst all those things, uh, you have taken that effort to come and contribute to this platform and to the participants who are here to know about this. So thank you so much. And now I invite Advocate Gajendra Singh Rajparohit to convey the vote of thanks. Gajendra Singh. Oh, here he is. <laughs> yes, uh, Gajendra sir is having some technical difficulties. So yes, ma'am, uh, thank you once again. We are honored to have you uh, as the key speaker for our session paradigm of uh, significance of public international law. Thank you so much for sparing your valuable time. And I would also like to thank Professor Brian Clark uh, for connecting with you, uh, our advisor, Brian Clark. Thank you, sir. And yes, ma'am, we look forward to your support to the Lexerodites community in our future. Good. Well, thank you. And um, if you're interested in disaster law, I can come and do more on disaster law. Um, but thank, thank you, you. For, the, for the lovely invitation. Thanks to, to Brian, a much loved former colleague of mine. Um, and thank you to you all, because although there is a time difference, you were the ones that had to accommodate me because I, I am sitting and it's uh, just lunchtime. So it's a much more civilized um, time of day for me than working late as you did in all the meetings you were sometimes very late at night, I appreciate very much, and obviously for uh, arranging things recently, I, I rearranging things, I very much appreciate that. And thanks, it's really, it forced me to go back to the basics and think about my own discipline. And I was thinking, this has been a really useful experience that I should be doing for students every year. So uh, you've pricked my conscience and uh, made me think about international law all over again properly, rather than just going through the motions. So uh, thanks very much. It was a really fun experience. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. And I hope we get together again soon. Yes. Thanks. And I would also like to thank the moderator for today's session. Absolutely. Akil George. Absolutely. And thank you so much, Akil, for managing my PowerPoint very ably. That was, that was excellent. Thank you very much. And yes, let me also thank all our participants for your active participation. And yes, uh, as mentioned, like Cerodite is inviting articles and blogs on different social legal topics. And do get in touch with our team. Uh, we'll be happy to help you out. And we're also coming up with some exciting sessions and uh, competitions. Thank you, everyone. Uh, wishing you a great day. Bye-bye.